Thank you very much, Lucy, and it's uh, certainly great to be here today to talk to you about our practical collaborative farming experiences. And I just wanted to start off um, by introducing you to my family, my wife, Bronwyn, our two children, Jaden and Amy. And as Lucy mentioned, we, uh, we live in a small community called Alawuna in the northern Mallee region of South Australia. And we live there on our 2,000 hectare property, uh, family property, Banyara. It's very marginal cropping country. Um, we grow cereals and, and canola and some other legumes. Um, and it's on 275 millimetres of annual rainfall. And I guess all my life, that glorious honour of striving to take my family farm into the next generation has been peppered with these great stories of how I get to work 12 hours a day, six days a week. No real need to uh, worry about having to pay too much tax. Probably won't get to go on too many holidays. Declining terms of trade, rising costs of production, and so little profitability that, as my father always used to say, the only ones that have the capacity to put a deposit on a new piece of farm machinery are the pigeons. So, and then we hear these, st these great statistics floating around, like the fact that Australia's farming population has collapsed by 40% within one generation. And that 25% of those who are remaining are over 65 or more, age 65 or more. And as I look around and I see the ever-increasing farm expansion that's around me, and I see neighbours buying out neighbours in order to create the economies of scale, it left me asking myself, so where am I going to be in 10 years' time? Am I going to own my neighbour's property or is he going to own mine? But it begs some big questions. If our family farms are not profitable and sustainable, then whose responsibility is it to do something about it? Is it the role of government? Is it the role of industry? Or because it's my heritage, because I've been there for generations, or my family has, is it my right to be there? Is there an obligation on others to ensure that my family can continue when the whole world is rapidly changing around me? Was it actually up to us as family farms to look at new ways to make it work? I guess I started thinking about collaborative models about 10 or 12 years ago with this idea of farmers getting together and working together to create the efficiencies and the economies of scales required for a more profitable and sustainable future. And in 2007, I was very fortunate to be awarded an Uffield Scholarship, which allowed me to travel the world and look at business structures. And so armed with $25,000 worth of sponsorship money from the Australian Barley Board and with the support of Nuffield, off I went on my own personal objective, I guess, of trying to find a collaborative farming model somewhere in the world that I could pick up, bring back to the Northern Mallee in South Australia, drop it into my own environment, and I would be more profitable and sustainable. But I never found it. There really wasn't a silver bullet. And so after five months of traveling, after two trips around the world, my Nuffield report summary could be summed up in eight words. There is no model. There are no rules. Eight words. Over $3,000 a word. I can see Jim Gilch sitting in the audience. He's probably shuddering and shaking as the CEO of Nuffield. But that was worth every cent to me because it made me realise that we've been just way too narrow in our thinking. And there are, there are actually huge opportunities that are out there staring us in the face. Because it doesn't mean that the model's not important, because the right model is absolutely imperative to have a profitable future. But that model has to be shaped and designed to suit every individual business. And whatever that model is, it has to be built around some core values. Core values such as 
efficiency, accountability, transparency, and a high level of professionalism within the business. And while there are no actual set rules, there are principles. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about these principles today, but I'm just going to touch on them because they are just so important. But they include being able to differentiate between agribusiness and real estate and understanding that you're actually running more than one enterprise within your business. The ability to utilise machinery effect effectively, and that includes the way you structure your machinery finance within your business. The idea of creating cells of optimum efficiency and then replicating them, which is creating the effective match of land, machinery, infrastructure and labour. And once you've worked out the efficiencies of that, replicating that in order to grow the business. Creating an environment of win-win or understanding that you need to have uh, the value of relationships right through every level of your business with every one of the stakeholders. You need to engage specialist services. Um, I think in agriculture, one of the things, especially in family farms, is that you're a drac jack of all trades and master of none. I think those days are gone. You need to have a level of independence in your business. Certainly there's an understanding in collaborative businesses that the biggest threat to those businesses is emotions and personalities. And so being able to have that independence in there to help you work through those things and also to use that independence to make sure those values of efficiency, accountability, transparency and professionalism are kept in that business. And also being strategic, working out where you want to be and how it is that you're going to get there. But I want to move back a little and start off with a blank sheet of paper and say to you, just imagine, if I said to you I want you to create the perfect family farm, what would it look like? I want it to be efficient, it has to be profitable, sustainable and professionally run. But there are no preconceptions. So where would it be located? How big would it be? What type of farm would it be? What would it grow? What sort of machinery would be required in order to farm it efficiently? What labour would be required? What sort of skill sets would that labour need in order to run the farm well? What would the efficiency cell be or the match of land, machinery, infrastructure and labour? And how would you go about determining that? How much capital would it require? Where would you get the capital from? What roles would people play within the business and how would you bring them in? How would you carry out effective um, decision making? What would be the best business structure used to support it? And how would you go about incorporating corporate principles into a family run business? In 2008, fresh out of my Nuffield year, my now business partner Robin Schaefer and I sat down with that blank sheet of paper. We had an understanding of the core values and the principles that were required and we had that list of questions that we just went through and Bullabara was born. Basically it started off, we had 2,000 hectares in our, in our family farm, Banyara. The Schaefer's also had 2,000 hectares. So we came together and we created a new business and we called it Bullabara. We leased our land to that business, therefore separating real estate from operations. We worked out that our efficiency cell for our area was 4,000 hectares. We knew that we could crop that at maximum efficiency with a 40 foot cedar, a 300 horsepower tractor, a 40 foot harvester, a 100, uh, 100 foot boom spray, two labour units effectively. We decided that we could actually farm two efficiency units where we were to add an extra level of efficiency. In fact, we put one sprayer over the whole 8,000 hectares. So we went out and sourced an additional 4,000 hectares through share farming and leasing to get to our 8,000 hectare cell. We then went and sold all of our farm machinery and went and purchased the machinery that we needed to most efficiently farm that 8,000 hectares. 
Some of that machinery was, was machinery that we already owned, but not much of it. Most of it we sourced from outside because it had to fit. Then we, uh, we worked out what capital we needed and worked out how we were going to source it and how we were going to contribute it. And then Robin and I put ourselves in the business where we added the most value. So in, in such, Robin became the operations man manager of the whole business and, and worked out all the practical and operational sides and I became the business manager and, and did the finances as well. For our roles within the business, we are both paid a commercial wage. So if either of us gets hit by a bus, then uh, we can be replaced and it doesn't actually harm the business. Above this, we set up a board structure, which has got an independent chairman who's there to make sure that we take all the emotion out of the business because we've got two mates that are working together and make sure that we're accountable uh, all the way through to each other and doing the right things by our families and to make sure that those values of efficiency, transparency, accountability and professionalism are always maintained. Basically, we are a family farm with a corporate mindset. And there are four different ways that we receive income from the Bullaburra model. We receive it by being a landowner, we receive it through being a, a shareholder in the business, through our role in management, and through our role being a labour source. Now for most farms, we, people are each one of those four combined. In, I guess in this type of model, there's the opportunity to be involved in just one of those, uh, or uh, two, three, any sort of combination. You could be a landholder who provides labour, you could be a landholder and a shareholder who's actually not actively involved in the business at all. But in each of these you're valued and the level of them can change. Bullaburra has now been going for four years. We've just taken off our fourth harvest. So I think it's a really good time for us to look back and evaluate just how far we've come and how it's actually gone compared with just running numbers, doing models and saying, yeah, you get together, how good it can be. So in looking back, it's really interesting that uh, in 2008 when we first sat down with that blank sheet of paper and we did a SWOT analysis of all the risks and rewards in the business, one of the biggest risks that we identified in our business or this new proposed business was a drought in year one. But we'd already had five droughts in seven years, so we thought we were pretty safe. But we got 2009, which was an absolutely devastating drought for us. So we made a huge financial loss in that first year. And I guess all the neighbours are looking over the fence and seeing all this big shiny machinery and understanding the amount of debt that we probably had. And so as we licked our wounds when harvest was over, we sat down and did some numbers comparing apples with apples just to see exactly how we did perform compared with if we hadn't been in within this collaborative arrangement. And the results were quite amazing. Basically, looking at cash surpluses, if we would have remained on our own as Banyara, as a 2,000 hectare farm in 2009, using the same machinery structure as Bullaburra, paying ourselves the same wages as Bullaburra, in that year, Broman and I would have made a loss of about $200,000. As a shareholder in Bullaburra in that same year, the result was about the same. Which was quite amazing, really, because we so with year one, in a devastating year, with all the setup costs, but with the efficiencies and the scale in place, we actually were no worse off. So now that we know all our input levels, our finance costs, our machinery costs, because they all remain the same, it's very easy for us to say, okay, what if it would have been an average year? If it would have been an average year in 2009, as Banyara, after we paid ourselves a wage, we would have just broken even. As a shareholder in Bullaburra, we made it, would have made a profit of over $100,000. If it would have been an above average year in 2009, on our own we would have done quite well and been quite happy, but as a shareholder in Bullaburra, obviously the result is certainly a lot better. The year that followed, after 2009, being 2010, was an amazing year. It was the best year on record by a mile. 
Those figures there for above average was calculated on wheat uh, at an average of 1.6 tonne to the hectare. In 2010, we averaged 2.8 tonnes to the hectare, over 8,000 hectares. I hardly need to tell you what those differences would have been, being in Bullabara and without. The other figures that we've played around with, and I could throw lots of them at you, but just doing some cost of production figures, and these were based on 2010. If we would have been on our own in Bulabara, sorry, in, in Banyara in 2010, the cost for us to produce one tonne of wheat would have been $204 a tonne. Within Bulabara, our cost to produce that same tonne of wheat was 171. Our consulting company, Collaborative Farming Australia, has also taken this blank sheet of paper approach with some local grape growers. And we created a collaborative vineyard called Sherwood Estates, based out of Loxton. Now, growing grapes is a completely different industry than growing wheat. And there's certainly other aspects that come into it, such as long-term plantings and contractual arrangements, and of course, water. So there are different rules that need to be created. But the basic model remains quite similar to Bulabara, just as it's turned out. So what it was, there were three brothers, or actually three partners, should I say. Between them, they had 230 acres of grapes. Each of them owned four tractors, a disc plough, a mower, a pruner, a sprayer. We sat down with them and they worked out that actually the optimum size for a farm that they believed they could run as an efficiency cell was 350 acres. And they believed they could do that with only three tractors, one plough, one pruner, one sprayer. So they set up Sherwood Estates. And knowing that their optimum cell size was 350 acres, they then went out and leased an extra 120 acres to get to their optimum size. They then went and sold all of their machinery and went and bought the machinery they needed to just farm that 350 acres. They put themselves into the business where they actually believed they added the most value. They paid themselves a commercial wage and they also set up a board with an independent chairman to keep those values in there and to make sure the emotion doesn't get in the way. The results were quite staggering. At the time that they were setting it up, the, the, uh, I guess the, the contract price for grapes in the Riverland was about $280 a tonne. The cost of production at that time was accepted to be about $380 a tonne, which is obviously why the grape industry was in a little bit of, pro little bit of a problem. They worked out that if they would have stayed on their own that particular year, the first year, they would have made a collective loss between the three of them of about $60,000. So by doing all the modelling, it worked out that if they were to come together under this structure doing just what I described before, they could take that loss of $60,000 and turn it into a profit of $60,000 between them, even though they were still $100 below the cost of production. This is after paying themselves uh, a commercial wage as well. As it turned out in, uh, in that first year, because, partly because of their uh, professional structure and, and the way that they actually went and negotiated with the wineries, they were actually able to achieve $330 a tonne for their grapes, which was certainly more than a lot of their neighbours. So that gave them a significant boost. And then they discovered that they actually had efficiencies that they didn't even believe were possible. And because of their professional approach and the technology they were using, they actually grew more grapes than what they thought they were going to as well. So as a result, in the first year of, of, of operation, they actually made a profit of $350,000, with grapes at 330, still below the cost of production. They are at this, as we speak, are taking off their second grape harvest right now. This year they've been able to achieve $380 a tonne for pretty much as an average for all of their grapes. And uh, the results pretty much speak for themselves. So can collaborative family farming lead to corporate success? I don't want to suggest it's an easy road. There's plenty of bumps along the way. 
And there's a great deal of emotion and a great deal of independence which is caught up in family farm ownership. But the thing is, I think we expect all the businesses that we deal with to be professional and accountable. Why shouldn't the rest of the world expect that from us? But with corporate success, you need to think with a corporate mindset. And certainly our experiences show that it does create a higher level of efficiency. Certainly a greater level of profitability. Um, business skills are recognised and valued. Certainly the integrity and the heritage of family farms um, are retained. We now have access to the latest technology which has just taken our farm to just a completely different level. There is a flexibility of involvement. My business partner, Robin, is actually, has just been awarded an Uffield Scholarship as well, and I think today he's flying somewhere from Oklahoma to um, Argentina. I'm over here at Abares, and uh, our farm is just ticking along very nicely without us. We have a much larger geographical footprint. There are certainly some succession planning benefits, in fact, huge succession planning benefits. There is a high level of professionalism and accountability within our farming operation, and corporate values and principles are bought into it. But at the end of the day, the best thing, the most exciting thing, is, is that it's still my farm, and will, be, will remain my farm, and can remain in my family. So, can corporate thinking be incorporated into family farms? Do family farms have a future? There's a great quote, I think, by Tom Northup, who says that all organisations are perfectly designed to get the results they get. And I think that family, you could say that family farms are all perfectly designed to get the results they get. So I guess the question is, is it time for us to think about taking that blank sheet of paper and maybe looking at twiddling a little bit with that design. Thank you very much.